On the surface of this particle in space, on the epidermis of this familiar planet, the Adriatic Sea is but a quiet bay of the Mediterranean. Mirrored in the blueness of the sea, sprouting alongside the evergreen treetops, scattered here and there are the silent but eloquent towns. And here, as we wander and wander on the edge of the Istrian Peninsula, standing firm and still, we come upon ancient Pula's necklace of stone. Any discussion of ancient Pula, any perambulation through the wondrous remains of her past, any deciphering of the signs at the foot of an arch or capital, must always begin with this edifice, the most expressive symbol of a Mediterranean town, a town of the northern Adriatic. No, the Pula amphitheatre, a rondo of stone arches, as monumental as it is simple, is not the oldest Roman monument in Pula, but the arena, as the people of Pula and of the world call this edifice, unites the harmony of the spirit and art of antiquity with the lasting characteristics of stone, which, rather than being of the past, would seem to be quite timeless. The era preceding the Roman conquest of these parts is lost in the deep well of the past, like an echo in space, while the remains of the prehistoric fortified settlement merely indicate a continuity of communal life, focused around the central hilltop, which was later to become ancient Pula. Following in the footsteps of the past, an hour on horseback will bring us to the eastern side of the peninsula, to the history and fortress beneath which the first ringing echoes of the written history of Istria and Pula may be heard. Speak, the poet Virgil would say on such an occasion. Speak, then, for we are already seated on the soft grass. That Rome would one day attack the region settled by the history tribe was becoming increasingly obvious here in Azactium, the history and capital not far from Pula. In vain did their swords clash when it came to preventing the expansion of Aquileia, the neighbouring Roman stronghold. In the year 178 BC, the Histrian War broke out. It was not only in picturesque ancient writings, but also in the reality of what was in those days a common occurrence, that the ramparts of Nazactium were drenched in their keeper's blood, which ran down into the deliberately dried out riverbed. Faster than the enemy lances, the Histrians inflicted upon each other the death blows of helpless defenders of the fatherland. Taking a last glance at the sea, the land and the skies of his kingdom, the Histrian king Epulon thrust his sword into his own breast. It was in the year 177 BC that the consul Claudius Pulcher triumphantly celebrated his victory over the inhabitants of Istria. The Roman colony of Pula was established during the reign of Julius Caesar between the years 46 and 45 BC. The gates of Hercules, dating from the first century BC, indicate that the mythical hero Hercules was the first patron and protector of Pula. During the civil war in the year 42 BC, when the triumvirates Octavian, Antony and Lepid waged war against Caesar's murderers, Pula took the Republican stand, championing the ideas of Brutus and Cassius. This provoked Caesar's monarchist successor, who was to become known to the world as the glorious and godlike Augustus, to vent his fury on the ramparts of the colony. Who then would have thought that none other than Augustus himself, having punished Pula for its Republican sentiments by destroying the town, would transform this place into what became a very well-loved and busy building site. And most surprising of all, this was to be the site of a temple to the goddess Roma and of one to himself. Just as opportunism is often a prime mover, so too is love.
We should therefore not be surprised by the tradition which has it that Paula's rising phoenix-like from the ashes should be credited to Augustus' daughter, Julia. Before Augustus' temple was built to mark the victory at Actium, where, having defeated Antony and Cleopatra, Augustus rearranged the map of the world, Paula had acquired one of the most beautiful stone monuments of the epoch and of the empire. Sometime between the years 29 and 27 BC, the Corinthian-style triumphal arch of the Sergius family was erected. De sua pecunia, at her own expense then, the triumphal arch was commissioned by the Dowager Silva Postuma of Pula, leaving a more than fitting monument to her husband Lucius Sergius Lapidus, who had fought in the Battle of Actium, and to his family. With its harmonious form, the surfaces of which are appropriately decorated with stone ornamentation, creating volumes of mythology, flora and fauna, this finely chiselled arch is timeless and far beyond the mere whims of taste and style. The position of the triumphal arch speaks of the power enjoyed by the Sergius family, while its other name, the Golden Gate, refers to the city gate no longer standing, which used to be known by that name. With the passing of the years and changing needs, the focus of city life moved from the central hilltop down to the site close to the seafront, where, in keeping with the Roman prototype of city and public life, a forum was built. The centre of life in ancient Pula was focused around the area dominated by a group of temples, the Temple of Augustus being the only one extant. Although not very large when compared to other Roman temples, it nevertheless gives an impression of immense monumentality due to its harmony and beauty of form. It was built between the years 2 BC and 14 AD, during the childhood of Jesus Christ. Next to the Temple of Augustus, the experts tell us, was another central temple, which the present-day visitor to the Forum will be able to see only in his mind's eye. It was, they say, dedicated to one of the Roman gods, Hercules perhaps, the protector of the city. The so-called Temple of Diana to the east formed the third part of this religious complex. The rear facade of the Temple of Diana may still be seen, forming part of the communal palace. May we be spared the envious wrath of Hercules' stone cudgel, for we must admit curiosity calls us away from the not-so-graceful form of the gates of Hercules and beckons to the sea where we find the Twin Gates, a perfect example of the constructional skills of the ancient world. The Twins, Porta Gemina, or the Silver Gates, Built in the second century AD, this double entrance leads us to the theatre inside the walls at the foot of the oft-mentioned hilltop of Pula. The repertoire of this theatre is not known to us today, but we do know of the laments of Roman writers and even the cries of the audience, who, given a choice between the more seriously conceived performances on offer here and the mass entertainment in the amphitheatre, would, more often than not, decide on the arena, where the games were considered to be a staple necessity of life, panem et circensis.
theatrical life of ancient Pula would also indicate that there was a special home reserved for those known as curator teatri, who were the theatre managers of the time. In what is assumed to have been such a house, we find a beautiful mosaic floor dating from the 3rd century AD, illustrating the fate of the jealous Dirke, who at any moment will be struck by the same death she had so perfidiously planned for her astonishingly beautiful cousin Antiope. At the zenith of its classical beauty, in the heyday of the empire, Pula was known as Colonia Iulia Pola Polentia Herculania, as can be seen from this inscription, a decree dating from the 2nd century AD. It is estimated that Pula had a population of 23,000 at the time. The central part of Hercules city was surrounded by the city ramparts, which were more than two meters wide, separating the city center occupied by the aristocracy from the suburbs where the common people lived. A god of fertility, Priapus, adorned the pyramid of an octagonal mausoleum, the remains of which can still be visited today. Numerous objects still existing tell us of the strong tradition of craftsmanship and manufacture in this city and its environs, while the country villas like this one in the Variga Bay on the neighbouring island of Brioni speak of the value placed on the clemencies of the countryside and climate of the Pula region. An army veteran or distinguished patrician may have occasionally erred in his choice of location for entertainment and relaxation, but not the imperial grandmothers, mothers and wives, who would often stay in Pula. Antonia Minor, mother of the Emperor Claudius and Caligula's grandmother, also spent some time here, and will surely not have failed to participate in the life of the town. Also among the famous matrons to have visited Pula was Agrippina Minor, the wife of Claudius and mother of the Emperor Nero. Wealth and luxury, misfortune and poverty, all encompassed by the walls and all beyond the twelve city gates, all of this would occasionally be overwhelmed by the waves of uproar and clamour of the general catharsis, which, during the games, would spread like a flame from this most illustrious of edifices in the colony. Outside the city walls, although not exactly on the outskirts, situated virtually on the seafront, in between two roads, is the amphitheatre of Pula. According to the legend, the arena was built by fairies who bore stones from Uchka, the highest Istrian mountain. And, so those more versed in such matters will tell us, you will find in almost every field a pile of white stones dropped by those fairies in times gone by, when surprised by the cock crow of morning. History, with its centuries of accumulated wisdom, tells us that the Pula Amphitheatre was completed in the second half of the first century AD during the reign of the Emperor Vespasian. The arena, the Pula Arena, is the sixth largest Roman amphitheatre in the world, and it is thought by many to be the most beautiful and the most elegant. An amphitheatre is a large stone monument echoing the blows of chisel against stone and the creaking of enormous winches. It resounds with the cries of gladiators and the roar of lions, which are lost in the reverberations of the clamour from the auditorium, overlooking the bloodstains in the sand. The arena bears within its stony breast virtually the whole of the history of Pula, finding its only fitting collocutors in the heavenly bodies which continue patiently to pass by, as they did in its youth, occasionally perhaps showing the traces of an extinguished star over this incomparable beauty in stone. This region, says Cassiodor, is a pleasure for the rich and a delight for the average. Shortly following the edict of Emperor Constantine in the year 313, in which Christianity and other faiths were given the right to public activities and propagation, one of the larger villas in Pula with its own hot springs was turned into a place of Christian worship. In the scrolls of history, and particularly after the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the year 476, new chapters opened in the life of Pula and of the world. In the year 556, thanks to the endeavours of Archbishop Maximian of Ravenna, who was originally from this part of the world, the large basilica of Santa Maria Formosa rose from the foundations of the Roman temple of Minerva in Pula. Following the outline of a Grecian cross, the basilica, with its interior brilliance and exterior harmony, was a perfect model for the architecture of the time. What remains of it today, the cemetery chapel, 
can give only a vague idea of its sumptuous former beauty and dimensions. Traditio legis, the transfer, handing over of the law, a part of the scene of a gilded mosaic on the wall of the chapel of Santa Maria Formosa seems to be speaking symbolically of the end of one era and the heralding of another different one. To the right of Christ we find St. Peter receiving the keys of good news. And here too he seems to be asking his Lord with the simplicity of a fisherman of Galilee, Quo vadis, Domine? In the background, iridescing from the aureola, are the golden brown undulations of time, which, with the tranquility of a soft monophonic tune, and in the ambience of an evening sea calm, bid farewell to an era which will, in the enduring waves of imagination, keep returning through the centuries, leaving its ineradicable ancient splendor as a legacy to the world. <laughs>